Okay, so we're now live, uh, Mark, and we'll wait wait a few minutes until uh, people roll in. Okay. Um, Yeah, good. good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, welcome to Wednesday MNR Day. And it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce to you today's speaker, Mark Zobak, who will be talking about a non EM issue. And as you know, in these uh, EM based webinar series, we like to have some uh, non EM talks. And Mark will be talking to us today about. Geo geochemical issues affecting uh, storage of CO2. And before I introduce Mark, let me just uh, remind you or, or tell you those who are here for the first time that you're on a, uh, an MNR, this uh, EM-based series, once every Wednesday. And if you're interested in seeing the other ones, you can go to the, uh, this particular link down at the bottom, and there you'll see all the previous uh, MNRs, you can watch the videos, get the presentations and register for the upcoming ones. A quick question, a, a quick uh, mention that you're on a webinar rather, rather than a, a Zoom meeting. So you're, you can raise your hand or you can send a question. Please send questions in Q&A and I'll read those out at the end and Mark will answer them. And if you're interested uh, to interact uh, vocally, raise your hand and we'll make you uh, speakable. Um, uh, a very quick advertisement for next week's uh, MNR, Rita Strike, uh, back to EM theme. We'll be talking at 1400 uh, UT on the use of EM as an energy major goals, technology examples and challenges. But, but today, as I say, it gives me great pleasure to, to have uh, Mark Zobak talk to us about uh, an issue that's at forefront in um, our move to uh, non-fossil um, non fuel uh, economies. Geochemical, uh, geomechanical issues. Uh, I've got Mark's uh, CV, which he sent, and you'll all have read this when you registered, and I won't go through this in, in detail, just to say that Mark is a highly accomplished and, and well-respected scientist, and it's, it's wonderful to, to, to have you with us today, Mark. So at that, I'll stop the share and invite you to take over. Well, th thank you, Alan, and I'm... Uh... Happy to be with uh, all of you today. Let me uh, get my slides going here. Um, I formally retired from uh, Stanford uh, a year ago after 38 short years uh, in geophysics. And especially for the last decade, I was heavily involved in studies of induced seismicity and CO2 storage. and. Uh, Today's talk is sort of where those uh, topics come together, although you'll, you know, you'll see other uh, components of it. And uh, as Alan promised you, there's no EM whatsoever, but I hope that the topics are of interest. They're certainly uh, timely uh, topics. So I'm going to talk about um, the need for massive scale carbon storage. And, and, and I really, I'm not using the word massive for, you know, hyperbole, uh, it truly is a large number uh, that uh, people use to talk about the role of carbon capture and storage in the subsurface that really matters, really matters when we're talking about a global, you know, energy system. And of course, it's only one component of, of everything that's going to be done to decarbonize. But, you know, the... Uh, aspect of that component, which we're talking about today, is, is, is just truly uh, a breathtaking scale. You'll see that in a second. Uh, then I want to talk about um, what most people are talking about, and that's the use of saline aquifers, you know, porous sedimentary rock saturated with water that is generally too salty to have uh, any sort of use for uh, um, people or agriculture uh, without a great deal of costly treatment. They, you know, they basically have no economic value um, currently um, and uh, have been talked a lot about for many years as a, a, a place to safely store CO2 for literally hundreds of years. 
But earthquakes are, are an issue, and I'll show you why. Um, they're, an earth, they're an issue because we've got a lot of experience injecting fluid into saline aquifers um, these, these past, uh, this past decade especially. And I'll talk about Oklahoma in some, at some length, but other places as well. And uh, the earthquake issue is very real. And in terms of managing earthquake risk, I want to address a question. Can we identify potentially active faults prior to injection? Um, because obviously um, we're often dealing with billion year old crystalline basement rocks or so, you know, uh, they've got many, many fractures and faults in them inherited over long, you know, very long periods of geologic time. But as only a subset are really active in today, the stress field that acts in a you know, given place uh, currently and are then prone to uh, triggering when you inject fluid. And I'll move, after I introduce that topic, I'll move to the Delaware Basin. The Delaware Basin is the westernmost part of the Permian Basin. And the Permian Basin is a large chunk of West Texas and uh, south, uh, Southeastern New Mexico. It's a very large land area. And the, the westernmost part is called the Delaware where there's been a lot of induced seismicity. Then I'm gonna turn my attention to the other uh, geologic environment that people have talked about a lot for um, carbon storage, and that's depleted oil and gas reservoirs and mentioned some of the issues there. And then I'll just sort of give you a, a just a little bit of a snapshot of where we are uh, today. I'm gonna be, um, it's kind of sobering when we uh, put it in the context of where we as a global community are expected to, to be in, in a few short years. And those numbers are, are sort of breathtaking. You know, people talk about net, you know, net zero carbon by 2050. You've heard, you've heard all the claims and the various goals. Well, as part of, you know, uh, strategies, roadmaps, scenarios that uh, different groups have um, tried to develop to, to figure out how we're going to get there, uh, they normally talk on the order of about six gigatons of supercritical CO2 per year being stored in the subsurface. Now, uh, in the subsurface, the CO2 is supercritical, so it's more like a liquid than a gas. The density under, you know, in reservoirs that are on the order of two to three kilometers at depth, kind of where you need to be, um, you know, certainly not shallower than, than one kilometer um, because the, uh, you know, pressure and temperature has to be such that the, the, the CO2 is supercritical and probably not deeper than three kilometers only because, um, you know, it's, it's more expensive, it's more difficult, porosity and permeability tend to decrease with depth. So that's sort of the sweet spot that is, is often discussed. But six gigatons of supercritical CO2 corresponds to a volume that is 50% larger than all of the oil that's being produced in the world today um, in, a, you know, in an average year, which is on the order of 30 billion barrels or, or, or 5 billion cubic meters, however you uh, want to uh, you know, count that. And that's from you know, a million wells, uh, hundreds of thousands of kilometers of pipelines, tens of thousands of facilities that you know, uh, are associated with this. So, it's, so the, the, the scale of the endeavor to move that much fluid uh, from one place to another um, is, is truly mind boggling. The goal for 2030 um, is often uh, cited to be one gigaton, and that's uh, still a, a, a very, very large number. In fact, um, if you look at where we are today, we're, we, we're injecting about 40 million tons per year at various sites around the world, about, at about 46 uh, projects, as the slide says, half of which is anthropogenic. So we're, we're, we're injecting about 20 million tons per year. So we have to increase that by 50 fold to get to a billion um, in, um, in, in just eight years. And, you know, there are a lot of numbers you can throw at this, but it's on the scale of, of, of a trillion dollars. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it's a formidable undertaking, you know, how, you know, what has to get done, how it's going to get paid for, how the process is going to be regulated. Uh, will it be accepted by the public? You know, we, we need to, um, you know, undertake uh, this. And if you do a little bit of CO2 sequestration, it's okay, but it's not going to move the needle on, um, you know, global decarbonization uh, strategies uh, that, that really has to take place. That's what these numbers represent. 
really, uh, you know, how it's a, you know, it's a net, you know, most things we do reduce the rate at which you produce CO2. CO2 sequestration is what's called you know, a negative carbon strategy. You're actually putting it away, okay? And, it's, it, and, and that's great. And that's why, uh, you know, it's a big component of these energy systems. And uh, as this uh, recent IEA study said, uh, getting to net zero without it is virtually impossible. So let's talk about saline aquifers. And there's been, you know, efforts underway. I think the first map I remember seeing like this, this uh, DOE, uh, US DOE Atlas was 2005. I, I updated it to the 2015 version. It hasn't changed all that much. You know, I mean, we, we learned more and refined some of the estimates. But if you just count up the pore space in these porous sedimentary formations that we already know about at depth, um, and equate that to volume. Okay, so now there's already salt water in those pores, but if we equate the available porosity to volume, the mid-range estimate is that we could store, you know, eight gigatons um, of CO2. So North America could provide a little bit more than one year of what the world needs uh, uh, by 2050 uh, uh, goals. Well, eight gigatons is a lot, but you know, if we think about, we've got to be doing six gigatons, uh, excuse me, 8,000 gigatons, not uh, eight gigatons. So, I mean, it's, it's truly enormous. But what I want to, you know, remind you of in, in a couple different ways um, is that it's, that's just the number. And the number represents pore space. It doesn't represent capacity. And I'm going to make that case as we go through. So, while saline aquifers are, it, you know, are a big target, um, that target has really not been uh, analyzed in, in any kind of detail. So the Society of uh, Petroleum Engineers has developed uh, something called SRMS, the Storage Resources Management System. That is a, an analog for something called the PRMS, the Petroleum Resources Management System. PRMS has been used by the oil and gas industry for, for decades because they use it in a transactional way when they're trying to represent how much oil is you know, in an oil field and you know, you're, you're selling oil or you're borrowing money to produce the oil um, or uh, the oil is, you know, the extraction process is being regulated. PRMS is the established way, the methodology, the workflows that, you know, the not only the petroleum industry, but the banking industry, regulatory industry have, have all bought into. So the engineers um, who are you, you know, mostly involved in enhanced oil recovery and using CO2 for that purpose, um, realize that for CO2 to use to scale up, something comparable would be needed and develop the SRMS. But as it turns out, you know, it's one thing to make this, these volumetric estimates, um, it's another thing to start looking at, you know, traps and seals and, and uh, geologic attributes. It's still something else to consider, well, uh, you know, what's going to happen when I inject into this? You know, what's the permeability? Uh, where's the uh, fluid going to go? Where is the brine that I'm displacing, um, you know, going to go? And so on. And so the realistic estimate is obviously going to be a much smaller uh, part of that, but the point of this slide was to illustrate that in terms of a comp any kind of comprehensive analysis of that 8,000 gigaton capacity in the previous slide, um, you know, 0.002% of that capacity has been analyzed to date. Now, there's a certain class of saline aquifers that are particularly interesting and particularly problematic in this basal Cambrian sandstone of the upper Midwest of the United States and, and, and uh, central Canada, uh, south central Canada, I guess it would be, uh, is, is a case in point. So it's an extremely large region um, and the vol a volumetric approach as, um, you know, yields numbers with some degree of uncertainty, but between roughly two and 700 gigatons, a big resource. And two projects, the Quest and the Aquastore projects, which you may have heard of, um, are going on right now into that. 
Now, Gary Teletsky is a petroleum engineer at Exxon, and he led a study about three that was published three years ago, pointing out that most of these volume these kinds of volumetric estimates are, are about a factor of ten too high. When you just simply look at some use some rough kinds of uh, permeability estimates, you know, for the different lithologies involved, the depth they're at, and, and so on. But these are even, even if we you know divided these by 10, they're still pretty big numbers. Um, OGCI uh, carried out an assessment and actually did flow modeling. And they said, well, let's just suppose that we had 16 major sources in the area, you know, injecting 100 million tons per year. Well, the actual capacity when you actually do detailed flow modeling is more than, it is, is three gigatons. So, you know, we've gone from two to 700 to three, just through this kind of characterization and, and modeling effort. And that, that of course has to be done everywhere. And that's sort of the, the sobering lesson is, you know, you can't just count the pore space. And there's another issue with these basal aquifers that um, is well illustrated by uh, the induced seismicity that occurred in Oklahoma, starting um, more or less around 2010 and continuing um, and, well, it continues today, but it peaked in late 2015, early 2016. Now, what, do, what you see in this map, uh, it's most of the state of Oklahoma, are black X's, blue X's, and red dots. The red dots are induced earthquakes. The blue X's are injection wells uh, that have been injecting salt water that was produced along with oil. And I'll, I'll get into that in a, a little bit more detail. So all those blue X's are injection wells and all the red dots are uh, earthquakes. Now this was uh, from the first paper, uh, my student Raul Walsh and I wrote on this, wrote, you know, we wrote it around the 2014, published in 2015. Okay. The black X's are in uh, places where you're doing enhanced oil recovery, but when you, you know, inject water in this case for enhanced oil recovery, you know, you're taking out oil and, and water and you're putting the water back and maybe even a little bit more, but generally the pressure is, is going down because you're taking more out than you're putting back in. And uh, it, you know, it generally does not lead to an earthquake problem. But certainly, you know, this is not, you know, induced seismicity as, uh, as we have come to know it over the years. You know, usually an earthquake occurs in an unusual place. There's something going on, maybe an injection well, and you know, you ask yourself the question: Well, you know, are they connected? Is it causal, or is it a coincidence? And sometimes it's perfectly clear, and other times it's not. In this case, you see, you know, the scale here is a hundred kilometers. You know, the whole part of the north central Oklahoma was lighting up, sort of all at once. If you look at earthquakes in Oklahoma uh, over the past twenty-five years uh, or so, um, what you can see is Back around, you know, the late 90s, um, the cumulative number of magnitude two and a half earthquakes was barely noticeable. It started to pick up around 2005, 2006, uh, certain, uh, certainly an acceleration around 2010. And then this 2013, 2014, 2015 uptick was really quite, quite remarkable. And we used Two, magnitude 2.5 because the network was you know good enough that uh, if a magnitude 2.5 earthquake occurred we, we, we know about it. Now prior to 2009 um, if we were thinking about magnitude 4 earthquakes you know magnitude 4 earthquakes are going to be widely felt but they're not really going to cause much damage but nonetheless you know your dishes might be rattling. Um, you know there was about a magnitude 4 or larger earthquake about once per decade. By late 2015, early 2016, there was a magnitude for, you know, uh, or larger every week. And so, you know, oil and gas production uh, is an important part of the history, the culture, the economy of Oklahoma, but the great majority of people who live in Oklahoma, live in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, and they're, they're feeling these earthquakes, you know, once a week. And they were really quite noticeable and of great, great concern. Why were these earthquakes happening? It's because in the time period at which all this activity 
was getting going, uh, you know, that I just showed you, oil was about $100 a barrel. Um, and a couple of very um, entrepreneurial companies realized that there were these formations, uh, the best known uh, was the Mississippi limestone. Um, people had drilled wells into the Mississippi limestone forever, and, and it was known for producing a lot of water, you know, along with the oil, like nine barrels of water for every barrel of oil. And so it was generally not very economic to produce oil from the Mississippi line because you didn't know what you would do with the water. So these entrepreneurial companies realized that, well, if they solved the water problem before they drilled the oil well, um, then they you know, can make a business out of it. So what they did is they drilled large diameter, deeper wells, wells down around two kilometers deep into something called the Arbuckle Formation. And the Arbuckle Formation really appeared to be perfect. It was a saline aquifer, it was a fractured carbonate, fractured and karstic carbonates, it's very permeable, laterally extensive, thick. It's even under pressured, which means that, you know, the water that comes to the wellhead is just falling into the Arbuckle under its own weight. And, you know, there had been injection of small amounts of, of wastewater into the Arbuckle over the years and, and, and nothing ever happened. But what happened this time is uh, 3 billion barrels were injected in just a few years via those uh, injection wells shown by the blue uh, X's in the previous diagram. The earthquakes that resulted are actually down here in the crystalline basement. So what happened is pressure went up in the Arbuckle. It did not go up very much, but it went up over a very large area. That pressure was transmitted to potentially active faults in the crystalline basement. It's about 1.2 billion years old here. And that pressure was triggering earthquakes on the subset of faults that are active in today's stress field, okay? And even in a relatively stable intraplate area like Oklahoma, you know, there are critically stressed faults. Most of them are not. Most of the faults are old and dead, but some are active sort of in a geologic sense. Those faults also tend to be permeable. And so the fluids would travel down these faults, change the pressure at depth, and, and trigger these earthquakes. Now, we uh, wrote a series of papers about this using something called the seismogenic index model. And uh, this was developed by uh, Professor Sherd Shapiro's group at University, uh, Free University of Berlin. Um, I hired one of his PhD students, and Cornelius Langenbrook spent uh, three years with me and it was just really, uh, really great. And uh, uh, what we did is we looked at the, the earthquakes in Oklahoma, that, that's, that's shown in green and the spikes are all the aftershocks. We related it to the injection volumes and the injection volumes are shown in blue. And you see there's a, a bit of a lag, the earthquakes went up as the earthquake, as the injection went up, but it lags, and that's because the pressure has to spread out, the pressure has to penetrate the depth. And we actually developed a model that, that would predict that the uh, pressure rate would come down when the injection rates were reduced and that the earthquakes would follow that down, uh, which, they, which they have done. Finally, after many years of trying things that wouldn't work, but were not very invasive for the oil and gas industry, the state of Oklahoma um, mandated a reduction in injection uh, in late 2015, early 2016. And that's what's you know, really, done, really done the trick. Now, um, we continued the work. Um, uh, we wrote the, you know, our papers analyzing this. Um, it, we wrote two papers. The first paper was sort of phenomenological and we considered the, the area as a whole. And in the second paper, we actually combined it with a, with a hydrologic model and Matt Weingarten, um, who is now a, a professor at San Diego State University, uh, developed the hydrologic model. And now what you can see is the excellent correlation between the occurrence of the earthquakes, which are the dots and the larger earthquakes, which are the stars, and the areas where the pressure is going up the most, okay? And they, this was done completely independently. The earthquakes were not used 
in the analysis, except for one thing, um, and that is the only heterogeneity in the model is this huge regional fault called the Niemahal fault, um, which we assume is a, a flow barrier. And the Niemahal fault goes from um, central Oklahoma and northern Oklahoma well up into Kansas. It's a large scale re regional feature. And the point is, is the injection wells on the west side were causing the pressure to go up on the west. Uh, the injection wells on the east side were causing the pressure to go up on the east, east side. And of course the earthquakes are occurring where the pressure is going up and the pressure changes at depth. We estimate are very, very small, just two tenths of a megapascal. And of course there's you know, uncertainty in, in the parameters in this, in this model, you know, Matt worked very hard, oops, to, con to constrain the model as, as, as best he could. But, um, you know, even if the model were off by a factor of five and it was a megapascal, it would still be a small pressure compared to, you know, the, the actual pore pressure uh, at depth. So the fault has to be ready to go. Uh, you know, it's a process in which we're triggering slip on a fault. The, the strain energy is already in the earth. Um, the fluid pressure is just triggering it, uh, the slip at, um, you know, you, you'll see a, um, a simple model that describes that in a minute. Anyway, uh, what we did is we, we went through a process and we said, so, well, let's just take the information we knew in 10, 2011 and see what the model would predict. And the model, you know, predicted the yellow line, the yellow dashed line. If we use the, you know, the data in 2012, okay, we would have produced the blue line and so on. And what you can see is what's, you know, actually, you know, happened um, has actually followed predictions that could have been made much earlier, you know, in this seismicity sequence, right? So we, we got around to doing this, um, you know, in 2000, 14, 2015, and yet uh, as much as five years earlier, you know, the, the model could have at least given us, you know, some insight to regulators that if they did, you know, reduce the uh, level of injection, uh, how the seismicity would, would, would follow that down. Why is this occurring? It's occurring because crystalline basement rocks are in a um, critical state. Um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, faults that are within the crystalline basement um, are mostly dead, but some of them are the faults that sort of limit stress magnitudes and are associated with the fact that the lithosphere is sort of deforming in a steady state. I'll come back to that in a second. This cartoon is from a, um, a paper I published, but it's very similar to uh, what a lot of people have talked about when you look at sort of the mechanical stratigraphy of the lithosphere, of course, the brittle crust, you know, depending on thermal structure, but in many, many average interplate areas, you get earthquakes down to say 15 or maybe 20 kilometers. You don't get them uh, in the lower crust and you don't get them in the upper mantle. The temperatures are too high and it is generally assumed from um, rock mechanics testing that the deformation of the lower crust and the upper mantle is, a, is governed by one of these kind of power law type models in which the strain rate, the deformation rate responds to the differential stresses um, in a way controlled by the rock properties, that's N, A, and um, Q, but it's also very dependent on, on temperature. Okay, so it's thermally activated creep. And the driving force for all this are just, you know, the, the, the forces that are moving the plates are transmitted uh, through the plates. So the brittle crust is deforming in order to keep up with the rest of the lithosphere. And so in areas where, um, you know, you're in a cold shield, air, shield area, the temperatures are very low, the strain rate is going to be very low the rate of earthquakes in the brittle crust is going to be very low. In areas that are, are, that are ductally deforming much more rapidly, there's also going to be many more, many more earthquakes. And the interesting thing, and, and this is a bit of a diversion I'm not going to go into, is that stress in the brittle crust seems to be high everywhere. It's just what distinguishes a really active area from an inactive area is actually the rate of deformation, not the stress level. And the way we know this 
is first of all, earthquakes, you know, are seen almost everywhere, you know, uh, uh, lots of earthquakes and active in the forming zones, fewer earthquakes than others. And in many areas where we built a dam and pounded a reservoir, changed the pore pressure a very small amount at depth, we get reservoir induced seismicity. And that can be seen, you know, in the, in the Indian Shield. It can even be seen in a couple of places in the Canadian Shield. Uh, Eastern China has far fewer earthquakes than Western China, but there are a number of sites of reservoir induced seismicity. So if a very small pressure perturbation is gonna trigger the earthquake, trigger an earthquake, that fault has to be just about ready to slip anyway. And, you know, I've spent a significant part of my career kind of testing these ideas. And um, uh, I had the good fortune of uh, participating in the experiment, the KTB experiment, drilling to, um, you know, almost nine kilometers depth uh, in southeastern Germany. And uh, we, we carry out uh, an extensive uh, stress measurement program. And here we're showing there's a dot there with a very small error bar. These are our estimates of how the shear stress uh, or the maximum differential stress in the crust is going up as a function of depth. And the dash line is actually coming from Coulomb faulting theory. And, you know, if you use laboratory derived coefficients of friction between about 0.6 to 0.7, the things we typically measure in the lab, um, it fits the data pretty well. And what this says, of course, is that um, the stress state is controlled by the frictional strength of these critically stressed faults, right? That stress is in equilibration with the strength. And then, of course, that's also saying that if we perturbed the system, we should get earthquakes. And we did a induced seismicity experiment. We did the first, and you know, we described here a couple more we're done later. Um, and we injected fluid at a relatively low pressure, uh, a couple of megapascals, as I recall, and, and we got a number of, of, of small earthquakes. And in my first book published in 2007, uh, I was talking about mostly oil and gas reservoirs, but these principles apply to brittle rocks. They apply to brittle sedimentary formations as well as crystalline basement. Now, um, a decade ago, um, almost exactly, um, Stephen Gorelick and I published a paper that was um, not very popular uh, with the CO2 sequestration community. And, uh, it's easy to understand why. We argue here that there is a high probability that earthquakes will be triggered by injection of large volumes of CO2 into the brittle rocks commonly found in continental interiors, because even small to moderate sized earthquakes threaten the seal integrity of CO2 repositories. In this context, large scale CCS is a risky and likely unsuccessful strategy for significantly reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for the young people in the audience, um, if you're going to write stuff like that, uh, expect some blowback. Well, I wouldn't change a thing in terms of the science we talk about and the rationale we, we pose. But two things have changed uh, in the last 10 years. One is the fact that we now know we have to do CO2 sequestration at a very large scale as part of decarbonization strategies. You know, a decade ago, we were thinking, well, this is one of many things we might do. Um, and if this didn't work, well, we just, you know, put all of our efforts in, in some other aspect of decarbonization. That's no longer true. And the other thing I would change is I think more, even more important than seal integrity is public perception, because you know, it might be perfectly safe if a bunch of magnitude two and three earthquakes were occurring in a given place. It might not really threaten the seal capacity, but it would certainly um, undermine confidence of, of the public in these process, you know, these kinds of projects going ahead. And, um, you know, once you lose public confidence, you don't get it back. Um, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. Another issue, of course, um, and it comes back to the Oklahoma case is the issue of being close to basement. And this is where these basal aquifers come in. So these are two pictures of the Arbuckle. This is the first paper published by Katie Coran and others. 
Um, and even with a sparse seismic network, they, they knew the earthquakes were occurring at the depth of injection or below in the basement. And um, a more modern paper after the, uh, the uh, seismic network was dramatically improved, uh, better models for uh, velocity as a function of depth were developed, we now know that uh, the, the surface, you can see the surface elevation here, this is so the top of the basement um, is here and the earthquakes are about six kilometers you know, below the surface um, or about you know, four kilometers um, below the depth at which the water is being injected. And uh, this is from uh, Dave Eaton's group. Uh, these are fracking induced earthquakes up here in the Duvernay Shale, but the faults are penetrating down into the, into the basement and the uh, biggest earthquake at 3.9 occurred in the basement. Um, this is uh, seismicity in the, uh, what's called the Ozark Aquifer of uh, Arkansas. Um, injection into this Ozark Aquifer, very much like the uh, Arbuckle was producing earthquakes down in the basement, the largest of which was 4.7. In the Fort Worth, Dallas-Fort Worth Basin, um, the uh, development of the Barnett Shale was injecting into the um, Ellenberger Formation, also a fractured carbonate sitting right on top of basement. And again, the earthquakes were down, uh, down in the basement. The reason this is a concern is because seismologists have recognized for a very long period of time that you know, the scale of an earthquake, the size of an earthquake, you know, is it going to be a magnitude four widely felt or is it going to be a magnitude six, which can cause you know, uh, damage in nearby regions. This requires slip on a fault of, of, of a certain size. It kind of makes sense. The you know, earthquake magnitude is a measure of energy release. Uh, it's much more common today to, we, we always talk about magnitude because it's just sort of the language we use, but we scientifically measure earthquakes by measuring their moment. And the moment is an estimate which you uh, obtain from the radiated seismic energy of the area of the fault that slips times the slip times basically the shear modulus of the rock. And so, you know, if you think about it, um, you know, the San Andreas Fault, you know, which produces magnitude eight earthquakes every few hundred years, produces more than a million magnitude, you know, one and two earthquakes, you know, for every, every big earthquake. And that just means that a small patch on a big fault is slipping. But if earthquakes are in the basement, you know, there's the potential that slip is going to occur on a, you know, on a, on a big fault to get a magnitude five earthquake. Uh, you know, we, we're going to be up here somewhere, uh, we, it, you know, depends on the stress drop and the earthquake and so on. So this is a range of values, but, you know, you're talking about the slip patch being on this scale of maybe seven or eight kilometers, right? Well, if you've got two kilometers of sediment, obviously that's a fault that has to be in the basement in order to produce an earthquake of, of that size. The biggest earthquake in Oklahoma has been a 5.8, and it did not cause damage because it was in a relatively remote area, but it certainly could have caused damage uh, had it occurred somewhere, somewhere else. And with a 5.8, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, a fault on that slipped on a, on a scale of about 10, 10 kilometers. Now, the other thing um, that we often forget when we think about injection of uh, CO2 into a saline aquifer is we, we tend to focus on where the CO2 is going. And this is a very nice paper that was written back in 2010 uh, by the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab Group. And the, the idea then, of course, is that the coal burning power plants in the Ohio River Valley, here to, you know, here's the Ohio River and it goes further east, would be captured from the coal burning power plants, transferred to the Illinois basin and injected into the Mount Simon sandstone. And they did their study assuming I think 20 wells, as you can see. And they, uh, what I liked about this study is they, they used a whole wide range of uh, scenarios. And because there had been various projects uh, into the Mount Simon uh, for um, gas storage or, or whatever, they actually had some constraint on formation properties. And so this is a typical example, 100 million tons a year, 20 wells, 
so 5 million tons a year per well, and they're injecting for 50 years. And you can see, um, so here's the scale, uh, you know, this is about 200 kilometers from side to side, the, the, the CO2 doesn't go very far, even, you know, even in 50 years at a relatively high rate, but the pressure goes very far because you're displacing that, the brine that's already in the pores. And these are bars. Uh, so here's a huge zone of three and a half megapascal increase in pressure. Remember, I was showing you two tenths of a megapascal um, uh, at basement of Oklahoma. It was about a megapascal in the Arbuckle. So here, this is three and a half times as big on an area, you know, approaching 200 kilometers across. So you're really changing the pressure a lot. And that's the, that's the issue. And, you know, this is the outline of the air, this uh, triangular outline here. And, you know, you're sort of bumping up against an area which is, you know, known for having um, relatively frequent earthquakes in a, you know, for an interplate area. There's earthquakes that went back into the 19th century uh, that are recorded uh, in this area. If you look at Decatur, Illinois, which is uh, th this red square here, ADM uh, is the name of the company that's operating it. Um, they're injecting into the Mount Simon sandstone, just like Oklahoma. You can see these faults that are light, you know, lighting up in the basement just below. The pressure change was less than a megapascal. Now, in response to these earthquakes, they move the injection zone up from the original depth to a higher depth. And that's because there are some flow barriers. Uh, they're called mudstone baffles. They're not continuous shales. They're not good seals. But nonetheless, they inhibit pressure transmission from the injection zone to the basement. And that has resulted in a reduction of seismicity. OK? And, uh, and that's good, of course. But in fact, the same areas are continuing to be lit up that were lit up before. So, you know, is this going to, is this going to be okay? I, you know, I don't know. It's a pretty small project. It's going to have a big effect uh, uh, on the uh, ADM plant that's there and providing the CO2, of course. Um, if a, say, a magnitude two earthquake would occur, which would, it, it's right in the middle of Decatur. It's, it's not a big city. It's a, a town. But um, if, the earthquake was, was widely felt, it could shut the project down. And so we come back to this huge inventory and we, we simply have to ask, you know, the question is whether or not it's feasible to consider these large scale um, basal aquifers. Um, you know, can we use them? Well, you know, maybe, but it's gonna take a lot of characterization to find out and, and we may be in, some, in for some unpleasant surprises. So what if we you know, thought about saline aquifers that were more strata bound? In other words, you're, you're not communicating with the surface, with the, uh, the, the basement, you're, you're closer to the surface. Before doing that, let me, let me uh, take a, uh, a bit of a diversion and come back to Coulomb faulting theory and address the question, can we identify potentially active faults prior to injection? And uh, Raul Walsh and I wrote a, a paper about this uh, and we you, you know, were developed some software that's been made publicly available called uh, Fault Slip Potential. Um, and it's, it's widely used now, I'm, I'm happy to say. Uh, we started developing it. Exxon came along and said they were developing a similar tool and, and we, we combined the two um, efforts and uh, released the, the uh, software together. And it's available. Um, uh, and no cost from a Stanford website. And we attach uncertainties to the various parameters because while the answer is yes, we need to know the state of stress, the orientation of the faults, the, the size of the pore pressure perturbation, and there's uncertainty in, in all of these. We've gotten more and better stress information. Uh, this is uh, some relatively new data, uh, a new uh, stress map of North America. Uh, uh, Jens Ereklund Snee, my former PhD student, is now working for the USGS in Denver. You know, very good data in, in some areas, of course, sparse data in others. And the, the background color is indicating how compressive the stress field is. Uh, we use a system that was developed by uh, Bob Simpson, 
where blue is the most extensional stress field one could imagine, where the two horizontal stresses are equal and much less than the vertical stress. And dark red is the most compressional stress field one could imagine, in which the two horizontal stresses are approximately equal and much larger than the vertical stress. And we think of some of what's going on in Eastern Canada are stresses that are largely associated with deglaciation, but, but that's another story. Anyway, the colors represent where we are on this scale. Uh, so we're mapping both, uh, and, and the, the scale is important because it tells us what style of faulting we're concerned. Are we worried about normal faults? Are we worried about strike slip faults? A combination of strike slip uh, and reverse faults, for example, and so on. We're zo we zoom in, of course, in areas of induced seismicity or areas where there's a lot of horizontal drilling and multi-stage fracking. And we you know, have these very detailed maps now, the Midland Basin, the Delaware Basin. Very interesting rotation of the stress field as we go from north to south. We don't, we don't see that very often. Uh, this, you know, we see stress fields that are, um, fairly consistent over large regions. But here, even though the stress field's rotating, um, it's doing so in, in a coherent manner. The data's you know, pretty good. Uh, some of these data uh, are, are not as good as others. The, the length of the line indicates data quality. Um, and one could quibble about some of these uh, C quality data, whether they belong or not. But this rotation is showing you that the stress is changing in a systematic way, and it's not random. So we need to incorporate the uncertainties. We have very good data here in Oklahoma. We have the fault slip potential program, the, you know, the wells and the faults, the geomechanics. We can do hydrogeology, but we you know, think radial flow is probably a bad way to analyze uh, pressure in the subsurface. And so we, we allow one to import a hydrologic model, and then we calculate this fault slip potential in the context of the uncertainties we've applied to all the parameters. And then we map that you know, onto the faults. And so this fault number three here produced a significant earthquake uh, back in 2011. One and two have not. So maybe there was an earthquake 500 years ago and there was no need for another earthquake now. Stress is not accumulated. Maybe the pressure um, you know, hasn't gotten high enough uh, yet, um, who knows? But many of the faults are not potentially active. For example, you know, the faults in green show that even, you know, there's less than a 1% probability of slip in response to a very large pore pressure perturbation. We also can identify faults that are not going to slip. Um, for example, this one coming right through here, this Nemohal fault, um, the stress is acting almost perpendicular particular to it, it's a steeply dipping fault, high normal stress, very low shear stress. You can't even make this fault slip if you were doing hydraulic fracturing right into it. And so every one of these significant earthquakes, significant because they're larger, magnitude four or larger, and significant because we have focal plane mechanisms from these earthquakes, every one of them you know, sort of fits this FSP model. It's, it's just really great. And um, we've applied it in a variety of places, including the Fort Worth Basin. You know, Seven million people live in the Dallas uh, metropolitan area, which was affected by these earthquakes. And so we did this in collaboration with the University of Texas. They mapped the faults, we mapped the stress. Uh, we kind of collaborated on pore pressure and uh, came out with fault slip potential. And when you look at the faults, so you can see the faults over here, the faults that did have induced seismicity, you know, the faults of potential was non-trivial, you know, uh, 0.2 uh, or larger. So we're, we're identifying, you know, the faults that should have been avoided uh, if possible uh, during, you know, when the wastewater was being injected. Delaware Basin's a, a really interesting place. This paper came out a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, Noam Dvori and I, and what we, uh, this is a, a map from the um, University of Texas. It's a stress map. The earthquakes are normal faults. The normal faults actually follow the stress field. Uh, you know, the uh, planes are striking northwest, southeast. The planes are striking east, west. The planes are striking more or less north, south, as predicted. What's really interesting here 
is that the seismicity is occurring at relatively shallow depth. There are only in a few places are there um, earthquakes down in basement. So they're kind of strata bound using the terminology before, mostly in this Delaware Mountain Group and Bone Spring, which is where water injection is occurring because of the horizontal drilling and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. You can see the earthquakes lining up along the faults. Um, it all fits um, very nicely. And when you kind of zoom in on the earthquakes, the earthquakes are very shallow and occurring in this Delaware Mountain group, and they're not occurring down in the basement. And that's basically why the earthquakes are limited in magnitude. And the pore pressure changes are very small. Um, again, uh, mostly you get a lot of earthquakes where there's hardly any pore pressure change at all. You get some areas where the pore pressure change is as large as two kilometers, but you're getting earthquakes in many other areas um, as well. Now, the reason we're talking about this is that one thing we noticed is that in the Permian Basin here, the earthquakes, which are shown over here in black and red, are occurring in the area where there was never any prior production from this Delaware Mountain group, which is shown here in the purple. So if they, you know, down, why was there no prior oil and gas production from the Delaware Mountain group here? There was no oil or gas here. There was the saline aquifer. But up here, where there was oil and gas in the Delaware, sorry, Delaware, Delaware Mountain group, there are no earthquakes. So it's really pretty interesting. And, and so why is that? Well, this plot on the right is showing you that it, this is pore pressure normalized by the vertical stress. This is the minimum horizontal stress normalized by the vertical stress. For normal faulting environments, this solid line here indicates when the faulting condition is reached. That's where things were back in the 70s before depletion, but this is what's called a stress path. As the pore pressure and the stress change together, they move away from normal faulting. So, you know, you drop the pore pressure by 2000 psi, and suddenly you're not in frictional equilibrium, you know, anymore. And so, in most cases, depleted oil and gas reservoirs, you know, should be useful for CO2 injection without induced seismicity, but they're still requiring some. Uh, what I call geomechanical due diligence. Just because the pressure is down doesn't mean they're okay in every other way. And so we still have to look at them, but it gets us away from this earthquake problem as shown here. If you produce hydrocarbons and drop the pressure, you don't have earthquakes. If you just inject into the saline, in the saline aquifers at pressures on the order of a megapascal or less, you get thousands of earthquakes. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over this a little bit. It's kind of a formalism for looking at how porosity and permeability and stress change together in this space of pore pressure versus least principal stress. The reason it's important is because we, we need to think about geomechanics in this context of depletion as well. So this is a, a case from my first textbook. Uh, we were illustrating these principles. It's a field in the Gulf of Mexico, a normal folding area. We had poor pressure and stress measurements available for that. Um, and we're able to map that from, you know, into this space and talk about the porosity and how it declined from about, um, well, the original porosity was about 30%. And now here it's 20, 20, almost a little bit less than 29 and gets down to about 27 and so on. So depending on how compliant the rock is, there might be a little here. It's about, you know, a 10% porosity change. It could, it could be a, a lot more than that in a more compliant rock. But if we go to someplace like the Gulf of Mexico, which is sort of everybody's favorite region for CO2 storage, the sands are weakly cemented and, and, you know, they're, ductile, they're not brittle, they're not likely to produce earthquakes. And, you know, because of all the oil exploration, um, you know, these, these uh, sands are pretty well characterized. This is the South Eugenia Island area, 
um, which is shown here off the coast of Louisiana. The yellow are the sands, the background blue are shales. And not all of these sands um, you know, have oil in them. And so you know, there's already seismic data, there's already wells. And so we, you know, we could consider one of these saline aquifers for depletion. But we would, if we were using a depleted oil and gas reservoir, uh, the question is, what did the depletion do to it? And for that, we're using published data from a, a, you know, a, a place over here in, in South Texas called the McAllen Ranch. And this is data that we were able to get from the literature and then replot it in this context of how has that reservoir evolved since it was at initial stress and initial pore pressure, which was very high. Uh, the pore pressure was you know, almost equal to the overburden stress, very what's called hard overpressure. And the initial porosities uh, in excess, a little bit of excess of 20%. And so the data that has been published for this field has demonstrated that you know, with depletion, the pressure, you know, changed from something approaching, you know, 68 or so, you know, uh, megapascals down to 15 megapascals. That's a huge pressure change. Uh, the stress went down about 20 megapascals or so, and the porosity, you know, decreased by almost a factor of two, okay, 40% uh, reduction. So the you know, we, we know this, but what that means is if we chose to inject into this reservoir, it's a much different reservoir than it was originally. The pore pressure is not the only thing, right? The, the stress is, is lower and the porosity is half as much and the permeability uh, is a lot less. This is some data we, we published uh, quite a while ago for these kinds of Gulf of Mexico sands. Um, you know, you can't relate porosity to permeability in a straightforward way. Uh, so this is the porosity change and the permeability change, but uh, you know, a 10% for these kinds of sands, a 10% porosity change could reduce the permeability by 30% or it could re reduce the permeability by you know, 60, 70%. You know, it's, these are big permeability changes. But back to geomechanics, the question is, if we take one of these depleted reservoirs and start injecting into it, is the stress path going to be reversible? Is it just going to go back up here and we could go um, you know, all the way back to pressure without worrying about hitting this normal faulting line? Is it going to be a different stress path because it's not the same material anymore? We know what controls the stress path. We know which physical parameters are changing as this compaction is occurring. And um, you know, this is something we've actually modeled in a different case altogether that things like this can happen. And so what this is saying is, yeah, we can raise the pore pressure. You don't get the porosity back. This is inelastic. Um, but you might be getting yourself into trouble at pore pressures far below the initial pore pressures. So you can't just assume, as long as I keep my pressure below the initial pressure, everything's going to be OK. Uh, you know, we have to do a geomechanical characterization. Um, not all depleted oil and gas reservoirs are, are going to be suitable. OK, so um, saline aquifers, they're great. But you know we've got to take the time and do the work to characterize them. Or you know, really bad surprises like these earthquakes are going to happen. And when they happen, you, know, you can't put the, the genie back back in the box. Um, and you know, we look around at the, the global distribution of, of projects, this and the, and the next slide are from the Global CCS Institute. And it seems like an awful lot is happening, right? And I showed you at the beginning, well, it's about 40 million tons a year, half of which is uh, anthropogenic. And so, you know, that's good. I mean, we're, we're getting a lot of experience, but if we put that um, into, the uh, perspective we've been talking about, or the goals, if you want to call it that, uh, uh, set by the IEA and, and, and others, it's not just the IEA, and you look at what's being done, and if you were to assume that every project that is operating, continues to operate, and is being investigated, 
is actually successfully carried out as planned from CO2 capture from a wide variety of sources, where we're going to be in 2030 is at about 175 million tons a year, you know, a, a fraction of, of where we're, we're supposed to be. So there's this, um, what you might call the uh, capacity gap. And that if you're talking about these kinds of million ton projects, um, where we're headed, we round it off to two tenths of a, a gigaton here. Um, you know, wh where we're headed, if we want to get there, we've got to be commissioning 70 to 100 new projects a year. If, if the template is going to look like, you know, what we've been doing uh, up, up until now. So it's, it's a tremendous challenge. And, and my, you know, I, I like to talk about this not because I think it's hopeless. I, I, I talk about it just so we uh, understand um, what the challenge is for something that is going to be badly needed um, if we're going to, in fact, uh, reach uh, the often stated decarbonization goals of having a largely uh, net zero energy system uh, by mid-century. So with that, um, I'll thank you very much, um, and I'd be happy uh, to answer any questions or expand on uh, any of the issues I talked about. So thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Mark. Absolutely wonderful. Um, th those issues are paramount to, to moving forward. Um, OK, uh, questions, please. Uh, put them in the Q&A, uh, and uh, I'll read the question out. Um, so it'll get in the record and, and Mark will answer it. And uh, as I said, if you do want to enter discussion, please raise your hand and we, you can get into a vocal discussion. So we, we have the first question from Chris Nin. A wonderful talk, fascinating. Have you looked at carbon mineralization in mafic and ultramafic rocks? Yeah. Um, well, there's a... a uh, a company, I'm actually on the advisory board uh, in California called Blue Planet, and they're, um, it's a, an, a commercial product, a commercial process, excuse me, to uh, capture CO2 and put it into a mineral form. Um, the issue of using natural uh, ultramafic rocks is um, complicated. Um, you know, uh, there's this carb fix project in, in Iceland, uh, and you know, the, the geochemistry is there, um, but I think the, the real issue is, is surface area and, and how do you, you know, maintain access to, to surface area without the system sort of clogging up. And uh, there's been some, you know, proposals that we grind up the rock and create surface area. Well, that, that would solve one problem, but <laughs> grinding up a lot of rock has uh, uh, got its own uh, energy needs and impacts itself. So I think it's I think it's tough. I think it's possible. Uh, how practical it is and how it can be scaled up, I, I think we need to see. And and when I look at projects like Carb Fix, which I admit I don't know very much about, and I think about you know Icelandic geology, and I'm no expert, but I but I've been there, and and you know we know that you know basalt is inherently uh, pretty low permeability, except for fractures and um, you know, inner flow breaches and things like this. And so I, you know, if I were thinking about injecting into a well uh, going through uh, layered basalt flows, I'd, I'd really be worrying about where that, where that CO2 is going. And is it, you know, escaping to the atmosphere before the mineralization occurs, or if the mineralization is occurring, whether it seals up those pathways before I can actually inject the large volume. So it's certainly an option. Uh, you know, we don't know very much about it. There's a basis for optimism, but there's a, a lot of practical considerations uh, that have to be taken into account. Yeah. It is, it, it, it's a good solution, right? Because it, it, it stores the carbon as a solid. And so it's certainly something worth looking at. Okay, other questions, please, from the from the audience. I, I think you've uh, 
You've got everybody spellbound, Mark. <laughs> with struggling with dumbstruck. <laughs> dumbstruck. Yeah, frighteningly dumbstruck. I mean, one 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 question for me is that when I started looking at um, um, the metals and minerals needs to to meet net zero by 2050, I found that uh, there seem to seems to be a disconnect between what we can do as as a mining geophysicist um, and what the politicians think we can do. How, how, are you, how are, you, are you interacting with the politicians and letting them know about these concerns? I, you know, I, I don't do a lot of that. I've done a little bit of it. Um, I, you know, I think the, there, there are, you know, any number of uh, issues, you know, there's, there's copper, of course, there's lithium and, you know, um, some of these things get solved as the price goes up, right? And more uh, resources become available. But, you know, right now, uh, you know, even making uh, anodes uh, with graphite um, is a challenge. 90% of the graphite used for battery uh, right now com comes from China. And, you know, and, and there are limitations on these, uh, these anodes. And, uh, you know, there are any number of companies out there are making synthetic graphite, graphene with, you know, a... Uh, um, a crystal structure, uh, you know, which is amenable to uh, creating surface area available for lithium ions, you know, as they fly flow out of the uh, electrolyte and into the uh, into the terminals. So there's there is nothing but challenges uh, in that area as well. So uh, um, it's going to be a, there's going to be a lot to do on on many fronts. Uh, you know, this idea that uh, decarbonization is a matter of electrifying everything and making the electricity as clean as possible you know that that's all true but it it has, it has a lot of the, 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 you know there are a lot of details that are important you know uh, batteries are very expensive batteries are good for you know backing up a grid on a an hourly or maybe daily basis but they're not very good uh you know at large scale for for more than a, a short period of time um, and so um, there's, you know, there's, and, and batteries are, you know, even batteries can't move uh, 18 wheelers or airplanes or, or large ships. Um, you know, it's, it's just, um, you know, everybody talks about hydrogen and hydrogen is great um, uh, potentially, but it's hard to make hydrogen. You need lots of cheap electricity, which we don't have. Uh, we're, you know, we ran out of electricity not so long ago in California. Uh, and uh, it was hot in the summertime and we couldn't import as much electricity as we needed from uh, the surrounding states. And, it's, and the price of electricity is going up everywhere. If you make hydrogen from methane, uh, well, that's, that works too, but you get 10 kilograms of CO2 for every kilogram of hydrogen. So uh, I don't know where, uh, you know, uh, the idea that decarbonization was just a matter of, you know, let's just do it. Um, it might work for uh, tennis shoes <laughs> for Nike, but, but there's a lot of things we don't know how to do that are going to be essential to decarbonize and, and providing the, the, the minerals that are needed for the battery industry and, and, and providing uh, carbon free sources of energy for which batteries are not uh, a viable solution. Uh, these are enormous challenges. Yeah, you, you, touched, you touched briefly on the, the social acceptance challenge, which is another dimension as well. And I think uh, as, we, as we move to mitigate um, uh, you know, carbon emissions, there, there are going to be social acceptance in, in a number of areas. Yeah, um, there was a there was a session at um, a recent meeting um, of the uh, Society of Petroleum Engineers on on that very topic, and uh, and some studies done by different consulting companies, and and somebody showed a uh, kind of a rose diagram, and each rose diagram represented a different community of stakeholders, and um, it had seventeen petals on it, you know. There, you know, people would just come out of the woodwork. Um, you have obviously the, the, the people locally who are most affected. Um, 
but you you know you have you know so many others you have environmental groups who are uh, just generically uh, you know in favor or opposed to uh, issues for you know whatever their their own reason and you look at the difficulty of permitting say offshore wind you know it took what 20 years uh, off the coast of Massachusetts um, Solar panels are a little bit easier when you're out in the middle of nowhere, like the Mojave Desert of Southern California. But still, you know, you know, there's discussion of, uh, you know, affecting the ecosystems, um, and um, the absolute land area is is just uh, uh, really, you know, unbelievable <laughs> when you actually sort of do the math, you know. Uh, it comes out to be about 10 watts per square meter, um, which uh, for a, like an average capacity of a solar panel. And that's kind of the average energy consumption for the, say the Tokyo metropolitan area, which includes all the suburbs, you know, something like 50 or 60 million people. So in other words, to provide, you know, solar energy, uh, you would you would need uh, a comparable land area, and you, you find that I've seen a, a map for the UK and a map for for Japan, and you you know you look at the footprint for offshore wind, or you look at the, for the footprint of uh, onshore solar, and it, it's comparable to the land areas you're trying to provide electricity for. So you know a lot of stakeholders <laughs> you know who who care about. Uh, land areas, people are affected uh, in, in many ways and there are environmental impacts. And so you've got, you've got to bring uh, a lot of people along and that takes a very long time and they raise the bar continuously on, you know, how, you know, can you guarantee professor that there will never be any earthquakes, you know, you know if you do X, Y, Z or, or whatever their pet, pet concern is. This is why, um, I, you know, companies like Exxon who are planning to do a lot more CO2 sequestration uh, are focusing on offshore areas because um, if you're you know, near the coast, uh, the state is the regulatory agency. And if you're further out, they're federal waters. And uh, you know, with a single entity, you can just meet whatever requirements they set. Um, with when you're dealing with you know, <laughs> 17 petals on the flower of these different stakeholders that come forward, um, it's uh, it's a much more difficult thing to do. So uh, that 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 problem, um, you know, can't be uh, underestimated. Uh, what, what did somebody said? There has it uh, trying to build a hydroelectric pin pin stock. You know, you divert some of the water through an underground tunnel, um, and you generate electricity, and then you put the water back into the stream. Uh, you know, not one of those have been built in California you know, for the last 10 or 20 years, and many, many have been caught up in regulatory processes. Um, you know, uh, every year, dozens of wind farms are, are denied um, because they're unsightly or whatever the local objection is. So, um, yeah, I think the social acceptance thing is the, could be the hard, in the end, the hardest part of the problem. Yeah, uh, uh, there's no more questions, Mark. So. I I'd like to uh, we've run a little bit over time anyway. I'd like to thank you very much again. For okay, my pleasure. Truly illuminating and uh, frightening <laughs> presentation. And this uh, this the recording will be available to everybody in a couple of hours. And uh, Mark, uh, if you would send me your uh, talk as a PDF, I'll put that up on the website as well. Great, very good. Thank you all. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye bye. Bye now.